What I'm going to try to do is to give you the background of how we see ourselves within the profession of architecture and how we work. Coming from uh, different backgrounds, we have about 30 nationalities working different places in the world, but at the same time with a sort of core connection to the Nordic countries, to Oslo and to the Scandinavian attitude, both politically but also, let's say, in the enhancement of how you look at humanity and the tool of architecture as one of them. And to me, that is the core essence of all we do. Architecture has, as you know, no meaning in itself. But the art of architecture is defined by how art defines architecture as art is defined by art. So that means the conditions for architecture are not the same within all the art disciplines, but it's definitely still an art. It's the art of architecture. And we have to recognize the fact that the tool of architecture is such a violently strong tool that the worst thing we can do in future is really to be ignorant, related to all the things that are in front of us. And I'm trying to explain just a little bit of how uh, we see this happening. Is, is that strong enough? Can we see that? Can we turn off the light to the left? All of this, of course, starts with the word creativity. What is creativity? Why is the human mind so preoccupied with creativity? Because it moves us from one place to another. So that's why we claim that creativity is distinctive. Distinctive in the sense that it is contextual. You can only be creative within the setting you're within. You can always all only rely on the given aspects of your time frame right now to lead you into the sort of creativity that you need. I come back to this when we talk about the creativity of mankind, understanding how they translate a history. Reindeer are genetically about 30,000 years old, but they still keep reinventing themselves. So, distinctive, yes, contextual, but contextual simplification. Not in a populist way not at all in a populist way. It's more like taking the soup, boiling it down, and still maintaining all the strong ingredients of the soup, and understanding that the taste just gets stronger and stronger. This would be a distinctive simplification, because most of the time, all we do is reinvent. So creativity is a sort of reinvention on a continuous basis. We connect known factors. We know this here, and we know this here. And reinvention is combining these two into the third solution. So that's how we relate to ourselves as creative creatures, in the way of trying to sort of promote humanity to think about themselves. So how do we do this? What are the methodologies that we try to look into? We have invented quite a lot of uh, words. Um, we call it uh, wordsmiths. We create words that don't really exist, containing certain types of meaning for us to be able to express what we think and what we mean. One of them is transpositioning in architecture. Transpositioning to us is similar to what orchestras do when they rehearse each other's instruments before a performance. The violinist plays the trumpet, the trumpet plays the drums, the, trumpet, the drum, drummer plays the, the bass, and so forth. So what happens in a creative process when you transposition yourself into somebody else's profession? <coughs> What happens when you dive into someone else? Okay, one, you understand how difficult it is. But also, number two, you don't think the same way as the professional, who is actually in charge 
of that particular professional specialist item. So that means you can think more freely. You don't have to think about the negative experiences you had as an engineer. Because all of a sudden you're an architect and you can think freely. Or you're a musician. Or you are a philosopher. Or you are a sociologist. Now, of course, this kind of transposition can only happen in the process as you rehearse the things that you're going to move forward. But it cannot be part of the actual performance because then we need our specialists as strongly as today. So our way forward is to claim that you would transposition yourself into a singular in the plural. Which means, yes, we build our communal thinking based on the individual, not on the group. Which means that you can actually perform much better within that particular group because you're always yourself. Let's say I have an engineer around the table and we're going to start designing something. It's a great engineer, and I know it's a great engineer, but I don't want the engineer. I want the musician in the engineer. That's how you put together the groups to become singulars, individuals, within a certain framework of the plural. It is quite important, because at the heart of our profession, there is only one thing that matters, and that is people. If you don't acknowledge the fact that people is at the heart of our profession, then you shouldn't be doing it. It's the first rule. It's only and only about people. If you try to think of architecture on its own sake, forget it, because there is no architectural definition for architecture on its own sake. So how do we organize people in the singular in the plural effect? Let me show you a short film. We define the cylinder, which is sort of the community. All the balls are individuals. We let them move completely freely within this cylinder, on the way towards a moving goal. Now this is important, because the one person going straight for the goal, as we know, will always miss. As long as you accept that the goal is always moving within the definition of the group, you have to make sure that the guy or the girl that actually hits the point in maybe a very unimportant sentence is lifted forward by the rest of the group and all of a sudden gathered through the bottleneck of creativity. Now in the office space, that looks like this. These are people with desks. And if you think of how a normal office would be organized, you would have a project group here, you might have the leaders in the middle or somewhere up on a balcony shouting with their things down. Or you might have the different professions organized and talking amongst themselves and with very, very few connection points. But if you started sort of breaking down all these type of hierarchies or ways of looking at things, all of a sudden you would find a chaotic picture. But that chaotic picture is a lot more efficient than anything you've seen in the structural organization of an office before. Here you'll find the architect, the landscape architect, the artist, the sociologist, and they intercommunicate in time through exactly what is happening right now and at that particular point in time. Now, of course, it might look a little chaotic in the office then, and and that might really be some of the issues. Can we find the things that we need? Yes, we find it every day because there's always someone who knows exactly where something is located. And that works with up to 120 people. And I, I really believe very strongly, this also comes from the education in Austria, in Graz. The Zeichenthal, the, the drawing room outside, very completely chaotic, obviously but everyone knew exactly what was where. So you're getting brought up to this sort of horizontal way of creating an office space. 
But people are more. People are not only our people in the office, but everyone we meet, everyone we sort of communicate with from smaller lectures, exhibitions, people that move around the world and meet us and come to the office. And if you're ever in Oslo, you're all heartily welcome. The doors are always open. Or how people relax in certain environments that you generate, which are not yet architectures, they're just exhibitional elements that portray certain attitudes of architecture. Or it could be with clients, like here for the Ground Zero Memorial Pavilion, down to the level of saying, the architecture we did here is negotiated, is not even designed. Is negotiated with 400 stakeholders of different types, Catholics, Muslims, Protestants, policemen, firemen, families left over behind, Republicans, Democrats. Nobody will have the same attitude towards a situation on ground zero. So when you define something from the very beginning as a negotiated project, then all of a sudden you're getting the people in the room, about as many as you, to come with their opinions and you're breaking down some certain specific boundaries that were there. So that becomes part of the process in involving people very, very strongly through their own participation. Of course we like it when the clients then start designing for us, that makes it much easier. So we run workshops with clients where they are totally involved from day one, before we even draw a line. And they just find ways of expressing themselves through six photographs which have been chosen by a scientific committee at the University in Tottenham together with us, for people to be able to understand themselves and the future of the thing the object, the project they're looking at. So they choose three pictures which they can combine with the possible future of this project. And then they choose three pictures which are completely the opposite of what they could imagine the project to become. So there's a negative approach and there's a positive approach. Then they have to argue for these choices, obviously, out of groups. And then they come back and then we send them into the model workshop. And they have to build physically the kind of elements that we're doing in the workshop. Um, no, the kind of things they've been discussing in the groups. It's, it's a lot of fun to see a client who's never held a knife in his hand. Or maybe not even uh, ever cooked a meal to his family. Uh, actually sitting down and starting to cut with knives and paper. Obviously we don't allow them to go into the big machinery. Uh, it's obvious we, we wouldn't like to have uh, fingers chopped off by clients. Uh, but it, but it actually does work, believe me. This kind of inclusion of people working together is such a relaxing way forward. It's almost like a game. And while doing that, there is a certain clarification in many people's minds of where this might lead to or where it might go. But people is people are also the gen general public, people we don't meet, we don't see. They are the kind of, for us, anonymous kind of people that use the things that we have created. And we don't know what they feel or how they should feel about it. But we do know that they will use it, and they will use it for hundreds of years. So there's an enormous responsibility also to this kind of intimate interaction between the larger public and architecture. We're assuming that the intimacy that is generated between the human body and a material is the pure definition of ownership. It's like, if I hold this glass, it's mine, it's on my table, so it belongs to me. I know it doesn't belong to me, but it basically belongs to me because I'm in contact with it. It's my glass. I would say it's my glass. Now, Somebody else holding a glass out there, or even sitting beside a chair, is not my glass. So you need to interact so intimate and so closely with the object that you generate what we call the feeling 
of public ownership. And that public ownership defines the long-term influence of the architecture, that is, for a more general public. Of course, in the case of the Opera House, like here, it also prepares the next generation that don't know what opera is or ballet is for a possible uh, long-standing opera career or maybe as a very interested public. And this, I tell you, this happens everywhere. It is generic. It's not because it's a Nordic uh, phenomenon. The library in Alexandria during the Arabic Spring became the hub in Alexandria for protecting everything that was of a certain value to the people of Alexandria. So they traded a ring holding hands around the building 24 hours a day to protect it against hooliganism during the Arabic Spring, to protect the values. And we think of the Arabic world as something that is very strange to us. And we think everyone's the same and everyone's thinking the same. Not at all the case. So that was one of the very few buildings in Egypt that never closed down during the whole Arabic Spring, simply because it was protected by its people. Why would they protect the building? Well, first of all, they could read books there which they couldn't read anywhere else, in Egypt, in fact. But also the plaza didn't have guards or fences. The public could walk all the way straight up to the door of the library in Alexandria, walk into the library and be part of that offering that that institution has. That <coughs> is being appreciated by the public. We've known this for some time, and it's been really hard for us to define it. It's almost like Allah Alto kept saying, you know, the thing with the wave, he says, I discovered afterwards. So it's, as you move forward, you, you get more and more conscious about the things you're doing, and you're putting them into certain categories and you understand why you did that at that particular point in time and all of a sudden you're moving architecture one step forward. Like the title of today's lecture, The Nordic Light, actually the book is called Living the Nordic Light for some topic. So we thought this fantastic opportunity to discover things about people that we couldn't discover in any other way than working with some topic. We interv interviewed four people over 100 years old, from 102 to 104, north of the polar circle, on their understanding of the light beyond the polar circle. Now, fantastically interesting, obviously, because these 100-year-old uh, people are the last ones still standing, remembering before electricity, obviously. So only through age, they became our specialists on pre-electrical and post-electrical times. And all of a sudden, they could talk about how light changed. Now, of course, they had oil lamps, not artificial lighting, but the oil lamp was never attached to a place in the house. It was something you took with you and carried around. So you had one oil lamp. When you were cooking in the kitchen, oil lamp was in the kitchen. When you were bringing the kids to bed, it was in the bedroom of the kids. One lamp, one chair, one axe. We've come quite far since then. But the specialization of age was interesting to us. So we actually combined that with taking photos by a very famous fashion photographer who took their pictures there. The resolution of these pictures is enormous. You can blow them up to five by five meters. You can walk into their faces. You can, you can fall into their folds. It's totally direct and translated. And by scanning their heads at the same time, we could 3D print busts of them. So these became our four heroes for the exhibition Living the Nordic Light at the Gallery Aedes in Berlin. And four people who had never traveled south of the Polar Circle were all of a sudden exhibited in Berlin. This kind of 
let's say, assume people's beauty, independent of place and time to some extent, we can all follow in detail. Is the knowledge that we got out of this important for architecture? Of course it is. Because combined with looking at these elderly people, we also had scientists looking at specific phenomena. We found out that it isn't true that because of the lack of daylight during the winter, the people north of the polar circle have winter depressions. It's a myth. It doesn't exist. We found out that people who have lived all their lives north of the polar circle have a tendency of reading more blue tones and more refined elements of blue tones in their sight than those living south of the polar circle, which, ten which uh, tendency is more into green and yellow. But the funny part was that those living north of the polar circle did not lose the green and yellow. It was only the blue and the blue colors that got stronger. Now we know why that's the case because of the flat sun, north of the polar circle is the only place on Earth where you could actually calculate maybe one and a half hour more daylight than anywhere else in the world, simply through the reflection of the sun on the sky. So the horizontality of the sun, as it moves behind the horizon, is so extreme that you actually generate daylight although you don't see the sun. So otherwise, of course, you know, all other places throughout the year have exactly the same amount of daylight, which of course also makes solar production um, possible anywhere in the world. So, from people, we move into process. We have also, together with this uh, research institute in Tonheim, developed a series of drivers that we believe are directly connected to how we design things. So, we call these drivers our guidelines. They're not methods, and you don't tick them off and see if you've done them or not. But they're simply conditions which we've been looking for, which describe us when we believe that we are at our best. When do we get the potential of the people in the office to actually practice the best? Now, one of them, these words, is zooming, which means Zooming, of course, both in and out. It's about the perspective. It's about where you are, and it's about the references you generate in a certain situation of time. Now, all of a sudden, you will notice that zooming out from an object might be just as important as zooming in on its content. In this particular case, in Alexandria, you will see the vertical and horizontal movement of all the structures along the Konish and all of a sudden you have this curved structure. That comes from uh, speed skating in Norway, because you have this kind of relaxation as you go around the corner. It's called a ville of in Norwegian. But in any case, this is a resting spot. So it's trying to take the speed of the city down. And to be able to see that in a larger context, first of all, you have to zoom out. Then maybe you have to zoom in on the certain elements that you need to provide this repetition of calmness into a typical object. So in themselves, all of these roof panels are part of the zooming theory. All the way into the walls and the hand carving that the artists did in order to generate the writings that you will find around the world and gather them for this artistic expression on the stone wall. All the way down to the chairs and the design of every screw and how you sit, and how you relax. So, really, it's a full perspective. It's not a Gesamtkunstwerk, it's a Gesamtwerk. And from that point of view, you move into and understand the influence of one way of zooming into the other way of zooming. One of <coughs> the competitions I'm very sad we lost, uh, but I'm, I keep showing it because we all know that you can be as successful as you want and you still lose 8 out of 10. Uh, we do too. So don't despair. Uh, we're all going through the same. But this one I'm really quite sad of. It was won by Herzog and Demon. It's the M Plus Museum in Hong Kong. And we looked at the possibility of a new museum typology which would frame the position of the visitor to the extent 
that it would become like a museum trap. So we would walk between the roof or a ceiling and a roof that would actually bring you into the museum without you noticing you were in the museum. And from there you would just fall into from the top into the exhibitions. And at the same time it would generate the reference system for that building at that particular spot. But it could also be very simple elements like here, ready-made architectures for Tivik, which is an outdoor sculptural garden. We were asked to do some few things and we just bought some few culverts, you know, these things that you have when you want to walk under roads or across a river. Very simple. They are being mass produced. Uh, and really all they do is create this framing which helps you zoom. It creates a reference system. That reference system puts you into a certain state of mind when you turn your head. We don't talk about sight lines as such because we keep moving our head continuously. So our eyes are always in the position of where the horizon is. If I'm 200 meters up on my own, the horizon is up there 200 meters with me because it's always where my eyes are. It cannot be anywhere else mathematically. So these type of framing strategies we've used a lot in order to focus on certain things like, for instance, in the graphic design that we're doing to create uh, gates that actually allows you to see certain things in the landscape and also refers you to the way you are allowed to move in that particular landscape, which is normally protected against usage and against people. Another driver is what we call generative resistance. Generative resistance is when someone's against you out of principal reasons. They just don't want to. They don't explain you why they don't want to. They just don't want to. Now that generative resistance is important. And of course, after 9-11, we were facing this kind of empty space. Like, uh, I don't know if you know, Raoul Bunschotten, I think, uh, actually was teaching here for some time at university. In any case, he said, the best place to be is between nothing to the left and nothing to the right. So that's kind of this generative resistance element that we're looking for. And in the debates and discussions of the resistance of doing anything at all, the capitalist elements of ground zero were the ones breaking ground. You can imagine the American society saying, we don't want anything to do with feelings, but money is okay. Because money is not really feelings. Talking about Trump. Uh, so, if, if you think of yourself in a position where you're supposed to be the cultural alibi, in a position of enormously huge high-rise buildings, which are commercially for the future, where the money of World Trade Center starts coming back in and where Calatrava has this immensely expensive uh, subway station. We are sitting with this tiny little building, the smallest of them all obviously, but mind you, within the memorial quadrant. And in this particular situation, the resistance was something that we decided to just accept. So we had about 12 different designs, spanning from 30,000 square meters down to 2,000 square meters, over a period of 12 years. So that's how much time it takes to have generative resistance. But slowly it started getting built, slowly people were taking it on. And you know that the waterfalls are called mirroring the past. Our project is called Mirroring the Present. So we're trying to normalize certain situations on ground level through reflections on how you see yourself and with the interest of the people looking into the different elements of such a building. And that's why it's clad with a reflective material with reflective glass. So it kind of becomes simple in the way of explaining it later. It reflects our position right here, right now. 
Another one could be environmental st strategies for the future. How do we actually get to CO2 negative buildings? How do you deal with clients who say CO2 is not important? In today's situation? Well, you work out of a mathematical proportion. You convince them mathematically. So, the forces against you can be argued logically in pure based uh, 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 mathematical equations. And then, of course, you can sneak in that environment is the driving factor for architecture. So then you get into new aesthetics. Form follows environment. And all of a sudden you don't need to worry much about is it ugly, is it nice, is it, you know, does it have aesthetic qualities that we like? No, you don't. Because you're undermining the whole aspect of aesthetics by claiming one thing, it needs to produce more energy than it consumes to its whole lifetime including embodied energy and embodied energy are all the screws, all the concrete, everything being produced, the food that the workers are eating, their clothing, transport of the materials, everything. This is the first project we're trying to do in relationship to this particular CO2 negative building. We have completed a couple of them. Uh, this is the next one coming in Tondheim in the middle of Norway. We believe strongly that our calculations are right and that we can do it easily, calculated over a period of 50 years. But it could be completely different things. You have clients wanting to build like a million square meters of shuttle on agricultural land. That doesn't sound like a good idea. This is just close to the um, airport in Paris, Charles de Gaulle. The client wanted one million square meters of shopping, entertainment. Uh, it was called Europa City. I think Bjarke Ingels is doing the project for the time being. Our approach was to say, if you build an agricultural land, you replace that agriculture with new agriculture. You don't build a building, you use that site twice. And to be able to do that, we had to go through and calculate the sort of turnover of this land. Because of the heat generated in the buildings below, we would have the first potatoes in France. And because of the noise penetrating through the sound, we would have the most silent sort of a noise barrier that comes down. And the size of the level of this shopping center is the same size as an average French farm. So things were starting to fall together, and we argued very long, and very hard, and we were almost there, almost. And then, of course, there is a, a senior manager somewhere saying, no. Nah. <laughs> it could be one family houses, this generative resistance that is sort of leading to our understanding of how we should live. We have enough people out there to describe what our houses should look like, our apartments should look like, because they've been doing market investigations, they know what we want. And they keep designing housing according to the way they believe that they can interpret and understand what we want. But architects create things that people don't yet know that they want. And that's the big difference. So this is a house for a small family, which is also, of course, CO2 negative. But generative resistance can be more. It can be understanding of bottom-up and top-down processes. This is in Guatemala City. And we were asked to do some iconic project in Guatemala City, which is, of course, impossible. So we said we would like to make a project for the sidewalks of Guatemala City, where the women are sitting and selling there are tomatoes and oranges, which are now being very often preoccupied by cars. So we uh, created together with local artists a series of benches, about 300 so far, that are located on the edge between the road and the, and the pavement. 
so the cars can't park on the sidewalk and you can continue selling tomatoes and oranges. And we believe that people keep talking about top-down, bottom-up processes. You need to manage both. You cannot leave one out. Sometimes bottom-up is the right, sometimes top-down is the right. Another driver, which we actually use quite a lot, is liberating laughter. Now, you know it prolongs your life, you do know that, don't you? You do know that there's nothing so serious you can't joke about it, you do know that. We know that, and everybody else knows it, but you have to use it actively in your everyday life. So, we have had times at the office when people have had to learn jokes by heart. Okay, every Monday we have the Monday poem, and every Wednesday we have the joke telling uh, kind of round. Okay, it needs to be sort of contextually correct, but it can be a lot of fun. And we use that in creative work also, because it relaxes the situation of, let's say, how you think about what you're supposed to achieve. It builds down you being afraid of something you don't know of yet. Another one is, of course, being curious. And I know these sound obvious to you, these drivers. But when you translate them and understand what they actually mean, then you also see maybe it's possible to implement them at different levels. What is the curiosity about creating a prisma? Well, it is always, again, in a contextual situation. So this was the first test for the facade of the World Trade Center Memorial Pavilion where we wanted to create a facade where you read two realities at the same time. So you don't really know if the car is located here or here because of the prismatic effect. So we wanted to double up the facade for people at different points of view to be able to read different types of realities. And that then meant also, of course, different types of light, depending on how the prism was turned. You would get the skylight you would get the grey light from, with the different wavelength from the asphalt, or you would get the green coming from the trees surrounding the building. So this curiosity is a driver, but also in a contextual situation. Maybe a little here like Pay White's stage curtain for the Opera House. She's a Californian artist and she said, I can do the stage curtain really fast, I can design it really fast. She went to her kitchen and took uh, aluminium foil, just crumbled it, took like two minutes, and then smoothened it out a little bit and said, here it is. And that's what it became. Afterwards, of course, it took a little more time because she needs to build in the reflections of, of uh, the seating, the reflections of the light into that composition. But this is a completely flat, woven piece of carpet. And it's not using one single silver thread. So it's all flat. It's just woven. It's woven in Belgium with different types of colors into the woven textile. So the curiosity is not necessarily setting out by thorough studies of where you're going, but by solving the thing that comes fast. That's curiosity. Go for it. Like also another project we were doing for a jazz festival in Kongsberg, uh, outside of Oslo, <coughs> we created a, a, a pa pavilion which we called uh, the Two Balloon. Uh, it's shaped like the air, but it's also shaped like an instrument. And what it does <coughs> is it collects the public below this big roof. The band is here. So the music is thrown into two directions. One towards the public and the one, other one down to the beer stands downtown Kongsberg. <coughs> so it's, the curiosity is not defined by what you think you can do but what you think you couldn't do, and then you do it. Rapid prototyping is another driver. This is kind of involving yourself very specifically with the time element of creation. And I'll get back to the definition of 
or maybe I should do it right now, of, of digital and analog relationships. We have four. We use analog, analog as one definition, which is everything you do with your hands and it stays like that. It doesn't do anything more. It's made by your hand, and that's what it is. Then we have analog digital, which is what you do with your hands and you scan it and you vectorize it and it, becomes, it gets computer information into the computer for you to work on it. Then you have digital analog, is what you create on the computer which is then being 3D printed into some sort of object or, or carved into some sort of object. And the last one is digital digital, which are things that only stay in the computer and never get anywhere else. And in, in the process of trying to look at prototyping as such, that is a way of moving in between these four positions of relationships between analog and digital. So say, we pick the wood for a particular building. You don't order the wood, you pick the wood. You go and look for it until you find the right moisture, until it has the right shape, until it has the right grain. And you buy the wood like this, you don't buy it from any kind of other company. And then, of course, that is being used in the whole world situation, which then becomes a CD translation, only through files, of this enormous knowledge that is based in the wood. Or it can be in our own workshop building one to one models for mock ups like here for the King Abdulaziz Center in Saudi Arabia in our own workshop or it can be molding facades for the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. We start moving into the CNC carving of the elements that you want to produce and you can actually test them one to one. So prototyping, rapid prototyping is a way of interacting between digital and analog. It gives you the means for creating. Another driver which of course we like a lot is getting physical. We uh, take our people up to the mountaintop of uh, Snehata once a year where we have what we call Dovre conversations. Dovre is the mountain area where Snehata is the highest peak. By the way we didn't take the name from the mountain, we took it from a, a downtown beer place in Oslo. <laughs> which is called the Hall of Dovre, and we sort of established on top of that with the back stair, you know, following by the toilet into the sort of place where you could drink uh, beer and port wine. And in this sense, we take the people up to this mountaintop every year to have three days of conversations, to try to lay out the sort of next year or two next years. Usually it's just one year because it's so busy. So we're about 150, 180 people gathered sleeping there for three or four days. It's not a study trip that we have with smaller groups, but it's trying to get everyone there to talk about really what are we supposed to do the next year. And by doing that, one important thing is to walk to the top of that mountain, Snehetta, which takes about four and a half hours up and four and a half, half hours down. What is interesting is that secretary from, let's say, Bronx in New York, who's never been climbing anything higher than a curbstone maybe, <laughs> actually does manage, of course. We all manage. It's not hard. You just need to do it. So, this kind of getting physical is important. It's physical on all levels. We've talked about the workshops. But it could also be understanding quite simple things. Simple in the context of how they're being performed. This is a calligraphy artist who lives in London. Who by way of moving the brush, generates a 3D image of that particular sign. You see here, it changes from here to here. That particular point is called the Farka in Arabic. And that Farka makes you understand that these calligraphies are not like our letters, which are simply extruded out of a shape, but they have a front and a back. They are actually three-dimensional. So simply through watching the movements of this calligrapher, we were able to shape Arabic calligraphy into three dimensions. And 
that again was possible to turn into larger compositions. Now you could you could debate the meaning and the layout and the design of this, but the interesting part was that in fact the calligraphy was three-dimensional and that made it totally different from our type of writing. But it could also be just being physical together, sitting in the cabin at the reindeer center and you know, doing hot dogs. Or it could be training young Egyptians to hand carve stone walls where we actually opened a full quarry close to the border of Sudan. We trained 20 young Egyptians to actually hand carve these walls. We brought the electricity in, we brought the machinery in, and these young people became physical and they are now continuing to follow up this tradition because the Egyptian stone industry had lost its way forward because of how the building industry is asking for stone slabs, two centimeter thick, certain size, that's what they can do. They don't know how to split the stone, not even the direction of the stone. So all of that is getting physical and down again into some sort of understanding of the material. We did the same in Carrara for the marble of the opera house and went in and picked exactly the places where we wanted the stone to come from. And the direction and the grain of the stone was chosen very consciously. This is from a quarry called La Fasciata, which was Michelangelo's quarry. We work with something we call knowledge-based intuition. What is that? It means that we think with our stomach. We actually have brain cells in our stomachs, do you know? And that means that knowledge-based intuition means that nothing comes from nowhere, really. There is always something behind that has brought you to this point where you react intuitively. I'll give you some few examples. Here is a you could describe it as some sort of arch, maybe a Roman arch, which has a keystone here. Now, this keystone in the description of Italo Calvino in Invisible Cities, in the discussion between Kublai Khan and Marco Polo says, the keystone of the Roman arch is our culture. If you remove it, everything falls. Economy are the foundations of this arch. If you shake them, but still maintain the pressure between each stone, then the arch will stand. We took this to Saudi and we said, look, you're, in a, you're not exactly driving in the driving seat when it comes to evolving and developing culture, are you? So maybe you should create something which is significant, like a keystone element, like a keystone building, where everyone could easily explain that if you remove this stone, for educating children, then the building will collapse. And it's not always the biggest stone. It's a stone that is capable of taking the pressures. This is how it looks when it's built. But it could also be the fact that you understand how to move certain elements from one place to another would actually work. You have this sort of intuition that this stone block, 180 tons, 17 meters long, 6 meters wide, 70 centimeters thick, could actually be transported to Berlin. So the movement of the stone itself becomes a project. And it's cut straight out of the surface of the rock face. So here the ice is moved on top of this, so it's smoothened by the ice. And we moved it to our Norwegian embassy in Berlin moving a small piece of Norway to Berlin. Here you see it. And here you see it in place. Now, of course, the ambassador wasn't very happy because they had, he had his office just behind here, so he wanted a window here. <laughs> you know, architecture is more important than one ambassador. But this intuition could also be defined by other things, and that's bringing me back to the reindeer. We won the competition for redesigning the visitor center in Lascaux, the cave museum center in south of France, outside of one, hour, one and a half hour outside of Bordeaux. And these caves are now shut to the public. It's not possible 
for the public to get in and see these caves. But we've scanned them down to 0.3 resolution and we know exactly what they look like. Inside, however, this was after the scanning, so we generated a 3D model of the caves. But inside the caves, we found the same reindeer that are actually today to be found at Snöhetla, where we saw them before, uh, painted 20,000 years ago. You can see it by their noses and by their horns. So they are genetically the same. As we know, most of Europe was feeding on reindeer in any case, so it's not a big surprise. But it's just a huge surprise to get into a cave and sort of see the paintings of 20,000 years of age painting the reindeer on Dovra, Snehata, the way we see them today. So this just shows this kind of span which architecture lacks today in the way of understanding <coughs> what time actually means. Being generous, I've talked a little bit about it before, the library in Alexandria and how it actually operates. Uh, it's a big room, big space, everyone can walk into it uh, and you can have a great overview. But it's also the Opera House, you can experience it individually. You can walk all the way to the water, which you hardly can do anywhere else in cities these days. The beaches are similar structures that bring you all the way to the water where you can bring the toes in, hardly exist. But in Norway it comes from a very old law which is called Allemansloven, which means that no private person can build anything closer than 100 meters to the shoreline or fence in any private property along the shoreline. So it belongs to everyone. Allemansloven means belonging to everyone. And we took that principle onto the opera house and by that generated a legal condition that was reflected in the Nordic DNA of how things belong to different people to all of us. But it could also be Times Square, how, which we're redoing for the moment. It simply is opening up the perspective of something that was full of cars, completely stuck, full of cars. And now you're removing most of the cars, you're leaving the taxis and the buses only. So how, what happens when this sort of starts coming? You can reuse Times Square. We give it back to the New Yorkers, no longer only the tourists go there. The crime rate has gone down, the local pollution has gone down. Also, of course, the retail prices have gone up, but... You know, and, and that generates to many people a certain issue, a certain problem. Because all of a sudden they attract... A free space attracts people you don't like. Like the Brazilian ladies that sort of like to be taking pictures off together with tourists and New Yorkers. Which then leads to the chief of police of New York saying, dig the whole damn thing up, you know? We just spend millions and millions, simply because he doesn't like the naked Brazilian women. He wants to dig it up again. How short-sighted can you be? Because in the end, the generosity that we're looking for is a new perspective. It's someone having her birthday at Times Square. It is the businessman taking a new perspective <laughs> of his business. Or it could be in Saudi Arabia where you reflect in Riyadh, the subway station, through a big bowl that actually reflects inside the station up and outside the station down. So you're generating new transparencies in a situation which is historically driven to release women from their drivers. Remember, once the Riyadh metro station will be a fact, it's the first time that workers out of different countries than Saudi Arabia, women, can move freely in Saudi Arabia. It's a huge achievement, and we support that all the way. <coughs> but it could also be like the tiniest little cabin, and this is part of a series which we call uh, keyless structures meaning they really don't have a key. You can't close them. They're open 24 hours. This little cabin is for a private client. Uh, you can see it sitting right there. It's, it's kind of just the situation of how to move generously with people moving in the mountains. 
it can house 21 people at the same time as a small kitchen, firewood, and even the sheep enjoy it. Or it can be our new design for the new Norwegian money, which you know all of a sudden becomes this tactile way of exchanging values. We really like money. I like the fact that it says 50. I don't like the fact that I have the credit card and it doesn't say anything. I overspend immediately. So this money is coming out next year based on a very simple idea. Some pictures from the coastal regions of Norway, that you can't see in that high. But the pixelation here of that image is equivalent to very, very little wind. And as the wind increases from 50 kroners to 100 kroners, the pixels get slightly longer because the wind uh, speed increases. Then it goes up to 200, 500, and at the 1,000 kroners you have full storm. So you really know, you should be careful, you know, how much you spend. So that's how they look next year when they're coming out. But it could also be a bank. We just won this competition for a bank Lebanese Francais in, in Beirut. But the client says, I want a bank headquarter with a kindergarten, with a youth club, with an exhibition center, with a lecture hall for the public. Okay, we said, that suits us perfect. <laughs> So all of a sudden, through the way of generating public accessibility into the private structure of the main head office of a bank building, you include the general public in a dysfunctional governmental situation. So you can walk here, the public can walk all the way up here, all the way up here, all the way up here. And the rest, you have to ask someone to follow you. By, by doing that, the bank is taking a stand as to what their responsibilities and social future responsibilities might be. And we really like the fact that they are taking that seriously and now we're evolving that even with them in direction of different events in the city of Beirut. Trusting presence is another one. In the office, trusting presence means Trusting exactly the place where you are. Trusting exactly the content of the place where you are. It's the model workshop with the robot. It's the coffee machine, the most important drug in the world, as we know. It's the communal dining table where we eat lunch every day and the chef prepares food. And it is our stair meeting point where we have what we call traffic every Monday, where we walk through employees' conditions, uh, who's divorced, who has a child, who's been sick. Uh, in general, what has happened, that's also where we read the poems. Now, I know we've talked about generative resistance, but let me talk about also martial art and repeat myself a little bit. Because martial art Again, back to the Ground Zero project. Martial art, as you know, is taking the forces that come against you and without additional forces, turning them back against your enemy. That's the principle of all martial arts. In architecture, that's very valuable. You should go and take martial art lessons and understand how that works. Use your body to put the forces back towards your enemy. But it could also be believing that the gravity of things that you're actually dealing with needs to be implemented within a certain setting. Like the roof of the opera house consisting of 36,000 different stones. And uniquely different. Which then, in themselves, create a more of a totality of the uniqueness of the expression of the building. But we know that if we hadn't used here, in this particular case, art, as in martial art, to move away from the building regulations that would dominate the design of this roof, it would never have happened. So it's defined as a piece of art. And we've used that strategy before. 
is art that does not follow building regulations. So the roof is art, and in that sense becomes a much art, working against the regulations that limit so much in so many situations for so many of us. Eat, love and pray. We party a lot in the office, I can assure you. We, we spend a lot of time creating wonderful parties. Uh, we've even trained the, the industrial robot, the cookout, to mix drinks. Uh, it's, it's really one of the things that sort of pushes you in the way of creating architecture. Now, I, again, I'm saying it sounds easy, it sounds straightforward. Really, it's hard work to do that. And finally, out of these drivers, we have something we call punk production, which really is breaking the rules all the time. Which means doing illegal stuff, people. Doing things, not necessarily that you get, could go into prison for, but basically taking a real risk on certain elements of things that actually pushes you towards new solutions that you didn't know that you maybe would have. For instance, this guy. It's not something we could know would happen, right? But it's something you allow for by, to happen if you don't undermine the position of the project you're within. I think I should stop here. I have loads of projects to show you. But I think it would be almost too much, no? No? <laughs> Okay, let's show a few projects. You know the Opera House, obviously. These are the kind of artificial elements that it's built up of. Uh, and it's to do with music, and it's to do with the interpretation of music, all the way down to the prototyping of each element. And you will see the solidity of the stone means there is no joint here. So this is one piece of stone which is sculpted in its own right. So if you break off an edge here or an edge here, there's still stone behind and no joint that starts coming out. So these type of details are important. We're working with the artist Olaf Eliasson on this kind of extraordinarily slow changing element of the interiors. And this kind of slowness, is, this movement is, goes for about 10 minutes. And it puts you into a position where you don't really know why it changes at all, and after a certain period of time, you understand that your moment in front of the toilets, because these are toilets, uh, your moment in front of the toilet is not described by anything else but the movement of that green light by Olaf Eliasson. Or it's just the light in itself, how it reflects from an aluminium surface under different weather conditions. So you choose the surface, how it's grounded, how it's related, to itself in a different manner. Like I said, it's the stage curtain of Pay White. But it could also be the house of an artist, which develops itself completely differently. This is an artist called Bjarne Melgon. He lives and work, works in New York. Uh, he's a wild guy. He's, uh, he's on drugs. Uh, he, he does whatever he thinks is right. He's on steroids. He's built his body into some sort of art piece. And he came to us and said, uh, I would like to build this house. Uh, and we said, yeah, that's great. We'll do that. 
but you have to allow us to go into a process with you to understand how your drawings can be interpreted as three-dimensional objects. Does this drawing have a backside? Does it have a space behind it? We have to get to the point where we start understanding how that actually happens. So we start interpreting about 1,000 different drawings of house designs from him uh, and generating three-dimensional shapes out of these drawings. They could be tiger heads, they could be animals, they could be people, they could be houses to sort of get into his head when he draws two-dimensional to understand what is he thinking about the backside of his drawing while he's doing that. So we took that, we digitalized it, and then we sort of like a very natural uh, sort of copied the drawing completely in three dimensions and turned it into a three-dimensional element. But then we reduced the information in the building and we came back with a building that looks like this. It's called the house to die in. He wants to come back to Norway to die, so we're designing his house to die in. But as you will see, th these are the drawings then projected back on the, the informational reduced three-dimensional production of his drawings. So they are being projected back on the building, and the different depth of engraving shows the different colors of this building. It's, it's a building consisting of burnt oak. Uh, so we thought we'd better burn it before he does. That's <laughs> 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 sort of this kind of situation. Apart from that, Japanese have been working on this for hundreds and hundreds of years, how to protect wood. You know, the hardest thing you can do is, is the coal that actually covers the surface. So for wood, it's a perfect treatment, and we've used it many times. The King Abdullah says, yes, I love the desert, and it's like the ocean. And it's like, you, you can have these Fata Morganas that come to you in the desert, you all know that. And the King Abdullah says center started almost like a Fata Morgana, out of a very particular situation where certain rocks started becoming this. And we've seen the project slightly, I'm just gonna <coughs> sort of take you a little, little closer to it, maybe. It's just about being finished, to be finished. But there is a huge auditorium, the Keystone with the children's education, the tower, which is lifelong learning, the Great Hall exhibitions, there's a library, there is a, a concert house for acoustic music. Um, and all these elements, we started worrying about the technology of how to clap them. How would we cloud these pebbles with like three-dimensionally shaped surfaces? So I said the simplest description of a complicated round form is the line. So we just start sort of winding a line around the building. And that in itself then were sort of the testing of the models. And that gave us a fingerprint for each pebble. So each pattern on each of these stainless steel clad volumes started becoming like a fingerprint. You could see these kind of things happening when the geometry of the building actually moves forward. And then we found a machine that can actually do it for us. So we could control every pipe down to the, the absolutely most precise bending methodology. We, all we had to do was to expand it a little bit, the nose of this. This is for producing railings for buildings. So we built a couple of machines like that. We started prototyping it, obviously. And looking at how would we get light in and still maintain the center axis of the pipes by squeezing them flat so they would become isolated from the type of windows that you actually generate. Yeah. So here you see a typical joint stainless steel giant situation. The other material, which is not stainless steel, is rammed earth. Now, funnily enough, they, it took some time to get them to accept the sort of stainless steel, but much longer to get them to accept the rammed earth, which is a traditional uh, um, 
our big uh, uh, construction method. It took us two and a half years to convince them that brand earth is the right material in connection with stainless steel. Because then all of a sudden you have the two spans of history located within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So once these start meeting on the inside, you have the pipes coming in and you have the rammed earth walls. These are fantastic in controlling the temperature. And we had, we had a, uh, a Pakistani workmanship there working on the Martin Rauch, uh, which we educated and they are now back in Pakistan building rammed earth houses there. So it's also about educating people, making them understand. This is the entrance up to the library. Okay. Stair. And the library is clad with acoustic panels, but which are mounted only in the middle of each panel, so you can twist them intuitively as you mount them. So the craftsmen come in and say, we have located the middle point of this panel. So the panel is like this size, and in the middle there's a screw, so you can turn it. So the craftsman comes in and says, okay, I like this better, so I'll do it like this, or a little like that. So the whole expression has a system, but it has also a lot of individual craftsman interpretation. And the graphic design that we are doing, this is for SAPA, SAPA the book, Aluminium Profiles. We generate full programs for certain companies which we believe in and help them develop certain products and the way they can be interpreted as pictures, half-finished products, uh, mistakes, uh, things that are not really part of their production line and turn them into something else. And I have shown you a little bit about this thing, but maybe you didn't know that it, the reindeer pavilion actually comes from the research on certain proportions uh, on cabins which are there in the region from before. And uh, that is the same proportion as this kind of framed opening. Which then again is the 3D wood carving element done in models, mounted, finished off. Or it could be the Aesop stores that we're doing. This is Australian company, skin care products, natural, ecological trying to evolve and develop interior architectures and retail architecture that gets really close to the users. Or a play tower in Austria. A play tower for kids and grown-ups, which is kind of located inside the Swarovski world. And we didn't have the space on the ground, so we said, okay, why not create a play ground that goes vertical instead of going horizontal? So grown-ups and kids having a lot of fun and doing that. In May, we opened the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art as an extension to uh, the existing building. And it was a big debate. Uh, obviously, a vertical museum, as you know, is difficult. Uh, with earthquake, it's even more difficult. And with a very narrow site, you have to be very careful with what you do and how you deal with the public. So the involvement and the development was to create this facade that is taken from the sand dunes. Even the material that is mixed into the concrete comes from the actual sand dunes surrounding San Francisco. And it became, quite quickly, a way of adding art into a building where you're moving with the steps, with the stairs, trying to avoid using the elevators into exhibitions that are important. Now, you've seen this, just show you the interior. 21 people can actually uh, stay overnight in this little cabin. And the interesting thing is that every piece of wood is made with the axe by a craftsman. So it's not cut. And by that, you reduce the usage of material from uh, having about 75, 76% of of the stand being used when you cut up to about 90% of wood usage. Well, the Ryerson University Center, Library Center in Toronto, just opened, where we tested out for the first time completely reprogramming a student learning center by saying we don't program it. 
It's like an outdoor plaza inside a building. So you come in and you move through the foyer, through this kind of picturesque uh, reflections of the surroundings, into a public plaza and up to the public floors, all the way through the beach, and no programming. Just simply open floors where you can self-organize as a student group with your teacher and you just claim the land, you squat parts of the building inside whenever you need to. And it's become so popular, the squatting, that we can hardly uh, keep, we have to start looking at maybe keeping people out, which would be, of course, a huge shame. We're doing designs for art schools, uh, for them to define their own identity. This is for a high school in Christiania. Uh, one sort of strange effect, which is I'm not too happy about right now, is that the students have started tattooing these things on them. Um, but we developed a, a, a language for them. And this actually says high school near Christiania in their language. And when you write something like this, that's how it goes. Now I'll show you a little bit more about Lasco because it's almost finished. You see the caves. You see how the artists now for the last two and a half years have been copying the caves and actually painting the scanned motifs of the real old cave into the new cave. The benches and everything are start, slowly starting to come. And the first CO2 negative building that we did was a refurbishment. Maybe with extraordinary success, burnt surfaces, displacement, ventilation, things you know, no new technology in here. Maybe the only thing might be that the displacement ventilation is actually the stair. So that is the ventilation shaft of the building or recycled bottles as walls, plastic bottles as walls, the geothermal, the photovoltaic. So the calculation of this is that we have a positive energy balance per year, including embodied energy, plus 143 kilowatt hours square meter per year. That means that this building, how it's done right now, is completely CO2 negative after 33 years. For the moment, we're also doing the Le Monde headquarters in Paris, the newspaper. I, I don't think I have to say much. I mean, it's the Globe, uh, it's Le Monde. Um, but sitting in an environment which has totally different attitudes, rundown situation in Paris. And we got the commission the Monday after the Charlie Hebdo attacks, and we met, met with uh, Louis Bachet, who is part owner and the former friend of Yves Saint Laurent, uh, said, we see, we've, we've seen what happened during this weekend. Now we're sitting here, and I want a completely open and accessible media house. That was the Monday after. So we went in, we started to try to design this sort of communal spaces that would go into the heart of the building, like big, this big arch, which you see here. And by doing that, really trying to understand more of the essence of the interaction between Le Monde and, and its public and its employees. We're starting construction in about a month and a half. But we also do a lot of smaller installations. This installation is called Lampshade. It was for the Singapore Light Festival. A lampshade because these are photovoltaic lamps, like 1,000 of them. During the day, they cast a shadow onto the interior space. And at night, they light it up with the same shadow. So it's kind of a sunlight delay element that actually penetrates through this element. So these type of things are interesting. Or other pavilions, like the Serpentine Pavilion with Olaf Eliasson, or <laughs> the beehives, you know, uh, we have 80,000 bees in these beehives and they're high tech. They control the temperature and they control sort of counting the kilos and looking at how are the bees really thriving inside these things. So now we're sort of mass producing these beehives. Yeah. 
So we're doing small and big, no consistency in whatever, what we do, and we like it that way. So I guess that was it. Thank you. Anything else?